Havana Tower, 118.1. Delta Oscar Mike. A chartered jet en route from Montreal to Havana. On board with a bottle of wine, Jeff Sterling, owner of radio and TV stations in Eastern Canada, a film crew from the National Film Board, and Joseph R. Smallwood, who for 23 controversial years was Premier of Newfoundland. He's known to all as Joey. I went to uh, the Soviet Union and uh, I don't care if I ever saw this guy over it again. I went to the People's Republic of China and I was flabbergasted, I was fascinated, I was, I was entranced. I think it's perhaps the most exciting place there is on this earth today. But here, right alongside us, is Cuba. And I thought I'd like to go down and see, you know, after all the talk there's been, very little of it, if any, friendly. But Sterling is investing in more than just a friendly visit. There's been an invitation from Castro himself. If we're going to do films and documentaries, they should be films and documentaries that have some positive aspect and some overview. And if we can film Fidel, we'll have something rich and rare. And there's no use our asking him unless he agrees to answer. If he'll allow us to ask him to spell out for us what price uh, Cuba demands for the uh, restoration of perfectly normal conditions, relations between the U.S. and Cuba, if he'll do that, uh, we could be the ones to break the news to the world. Welcome to Cuba, the capitalist and the socialist. Yes, Joey's been calling himself a socialist all his life. Hence his interest in this island, this leader, and this revolution. Those in favor of the revolution, put up their hand, look at Those that. who are not in favor of the revolution, make a long face. Todos aquellos, fíjese, no levantan la mano hasta que no lo digan. Todos aquellos que están a favor de la revolución, que levantan la mano y los que no... Todos mis hijos. Ok. And now, at 73, he's free to travel, practice some unofficial diplomacy, and have some fun in strange places. Sterling's from Newfoundland, too. They've known each other for years and, in fact, were once on opposite sides of the Confederation fight. The Cubans certainly seem to be expecting us. This fleet of Volgas, this house at our disposal, Protocol House Number 9, it's called, former residence of an American textile tycoon. So here, apparently, we'll wait, sorting out our questions. Waiting for Fidel to drive through the gates. Prime Minister, you're a, a doctor, Dr. Fidel Castro. What? A doctor of what, Prime Minister? What are you a, a doctor of? And was this doctorate conferred on you, honoris causa? I mean, <laughs> Maybe any, that's why they put us here. Anybody, yeah, yeah but they, they, they put us there because we have a head of a former head of government with us, uh, who's, who's this guy? Who they, and they have to and they have to go through the protocol, which we're here. If we weren't here with him, we'd probably be down the tent in the river. I was somewhere. here last year, and I was then a former head of government. And they put me in a nice hotel, but not in marble halls. Well, there must be a message there somewhere. You, you mean, Maybe they know but you're since then I met uh, Fidel Castro at Gander, and uh, we had a lovely chat. That's right. And I said I'd like to come down and make a movie. He said, come down and 
and uh, we will help in every way. That's right. Well, now do you you're think right. he really knows us? I mean, maybe he knows you, but do you think he knows that Jeff is a millionaire? Does he know no, that? I'm no. sure he does. Yeah. I've told every official who has, <laughs> <laughs> who has come what? to see what? us from external me. affairs that uh, Jeff Sterling is a very, very rich man, I, I, and he's not coming down here to swallow this communism lock, uh, lock stock, stock and barrel, barrel. Or hook, line, and sinker. Well, I certainly hope you also told them that I give back to my fellow human beings 76 cents on every dollar. Oh, uh, no, you I don't make. give it, they take it. The uh, government takes it in I, taxes. Well, in that sense, but I give it willingly. Well, that's good. That's good. Sterling took holidays here before the revolution. Now he finds Havana seedy and run down. But the Cubans say that they're putting their efforts into the countryside, for Havana was always overfed. Prime Minister, what, what difference has the revolution made in these things? In crime and alcoholism and dope and organized prostitution and unemployment and poverty and slums. Cuba was really notorious. <laughs> Infamous, even. Tell me about it, would you? Where are they coming? All aboard. <laughs> no, no, no. We're going to come. The interview may be a day or two. So in the meantime, there are excursions to take. The island that Joey ruled was almost as poor as Cuba, especially in services for people like schools and hospitals. These he built, and these, of course, he wants to see in Cuba. So this first morning, we're at a revolutionary new high school just outside Havana, the Lennon School. It looks relaxed, not so different. But really, it's utterly different. You need marks in the 80s to enter and to stay. You have a tough schedule that starts at 6 a.m. each morning and ends at 10 p.m. No dreamy adolescence here. You're here to learn to work. And they live in it all the, all the week around. Uh, Saturday afternoon, they get a free bus and they, they go home. They come back 11 o'clock Sunday night. Okay, so they're spending five and a half days there in that school. They're fed, they're clothed, they pay no tuition fees. They pay nothing for anything. It's all completely free. Do they get paid and for five, the 15 hours of work? No, wait, they do? no. Five yeah. hours a day. Yes, they get paid for it with free tuition, mm. free clothes, free food. Like our Newfoundland fishermen used to, with no money involved. They get a five hours a day tuition. Three hours a day, they go in this classroom or that classroom or the other classroom where they make baseballs, they make. Uh, they make baseball uh, mitts. mitts, they make uh, shorts to wear, they make uh, sweaters, they make, uh, radio. they assemble radio sets, computers, and they assemble computer sets and so on. Okay, three hours a day. So, uh, the, it's not a sweatshop. You yeah. seem to be equating it with that. Yeah, but I, I can't help, uh, uh, Mike, equate anything. When I see a child of, of 11 years of age sitting at a sewing machine uh, for 15 hours a week. Now that little girl 
uh, could certainly be doing other things. She's going to have to be sitting at that sewing machine soon, sooner or later. And surely you're not going to steal. Doesn't follow. Doesn't follow that she will. Look, Jeff. There's something <laughs> Your else. Your eyes must tell you it's not a switch. Look, there's you're talking else. Look, to look, me. Look, Jeff. Hours a week. Uh, and so many eleven uh, years. In ten years, old. nothing. In ten compared. years, that's so many hours. <laughs> that's <laughs> nothing compared to what our tele children spend in front of television. But that's nonsense. It I've got children nonsense. the same age, and they don't spend. I mean, you're throwing I don't all care these about generalities, your Mike. We're it talking is not about true. You're talking 11, 12, 13, 14 year old children in factories, fifteen hours a week. Now, for the love of heaven, that's not factories. They're classrooms. Oh, look, if you want to be apologetic for this whole system, that's fine. But it isn't my way of looking no, at I it. No, I want to learn something. You well, don't want to learn anything. You're not learning. You're saying, put the child, put the child in I here, make something. him happy 15 hours a week, making these little things which one machine can make. Your trouble is oh, I'm that sure you look trouble. upon work as a penalty, as a no, punishment. No, I don't. I look work. upon York as a chance to expand, but work is not... The, the work of the laborer, the work of the hands, the work is a chance to expand the God-given things that God gave you, which they don't believe in. Every which means child in Cuba works with his hands. How many grandchildren do he you does, have? He does, I'm not talking about them. I want to ask them when I get back. Uh, all I right. Take a vote. Every they child, I would like to see every child in Newfoundland and in Canada work. I would like to smash, At what age will you start? I would like to smash forever, for all time, anyone's habit of looking down his nose at work, at the worker. I would like to see every child do some work. I would like to see the students in our university do some work too. Surely a child should have the, the freedom of the childhood. I mean, that's the basic concept, isn't it, in our, in, our, in our free enterprise system, that we try to give our children their childhoods. The Cubans say that they just can't afford to give their teenagers non-productive years. Schools have to pay for themselves. I thought this idea of self-sufficiency would appeal to a self-made man like Jeff. So I asked him that night what he would do if he came to the conclusion... ...that they were right and that the system of which you were part of was wrong. What would you do about it? You would well, just hope that it wouldn't happen in Canada. No, not on the contrary. We'd, be, we'd all become communist. You really think that we can't make it in a communist country? Man, if I'm sitting here and I've got this house in a communist country and, and all the trappings of the same power... Everything you did had to be measured. Does this help other people? Is this good for other people? Well, all I know wouldn't now that, be... that I would suggest that all the employees I've got in communications right now are doing a hell of a lot better than all the employees and communications here in Cuba. No, that's not a fair comparison. Why not? This is a poor country. If we could stand up everybody in radio and television working in a communist country anywhere in the world and said, you've got a choice and you won't be shot if you take it, to get on a plane right now and work for a, a free enterprise system, I'll guarantee you we'll be ferrying people out of all those countries. All right, but then, for Jeff, what does that time. say? Out of here, I don't think you would. <laughs> Wait a minute, even if it's true. I don't think you would be. No, but well, even if he's right. Let them give Suppose you a, he's right. Uh, Suppose on right, I'm he's right. right. <laughs> the thing has only been on 15 years. Well, how much here? do you want? 15, not 1,500, but say 100. I mean, they may be onto something that's so far beyond anything we can conceive that we're going to come back here in 15 years and find that they really have touch the, mm. the the final thing where each man and each each individual has a tremendous well, feeling one thing, of one fulfillment. Thing I think we can agree on. If we can get an interview with Fidel Castro, it should be interesting. We asked to visit Havana's mental hospital, looking for some clue perhaps to the mental health of the revolution as a whole. The hospital is run by a revolutionary colleague of Fidel's. Dr. Barnaby Ordaz. Uh, doctor, you uh, you know Fidel? You uh, were studying together. You were in the university together. We were studying together. Uh, he was the president of the law school. I happened to be the president of the medical school. Uh, with the advent of the revolution, <coughs> we have 6,000 patients here. Now we have 4,000, I mean 2,000 are going back to society and they are not, they are not dead or anything like that, they are living people. Yeah. Are you using the, the advanced LSD treatment they use for schizo in other parts of the world, in Russia I gather? <laughs> the thing is this, since 90% of the cases here are but uh, schizophrenia. Mm. Uh, double split personality. Uh, that's right. So. 
Uh, so we use this occupational therapy. Work because there. they have been passed through so all the treatment that we have here. And they're chronic. And they're chronic. What's he done during his life? Uh, he was born in, uh, he was born 1973 years ago. Everything in the world, I made it myself. Yo peleé the cuando peleó, yo era socio de Hitler. I was a Hitler's partner. Le gané a Stalin. Y después me peleé con Hitler. I conquered Hitler. Stalin. Me peleé con Hitler y fui para Rusia y hice la línea de cifre. De esquizofrenia paranoia. This is a paranoic schizophrenia case. Dr. Ordez claims that in other societies, this crazy old man would just be thrown out on the rubbish heap. Desde que nosotros lo tenemos, pues ya él trabaja aquí con nosotros. Now, since we've taken care of him, and like like him, de una, we have given them and him portero, some responsibility. In this case, he happens to be a gate tiene man. Su sueldo. He's being paid a salary. Dale, que van a tirarte una foto ahí, dale. Dale, que van a tirar una foto ahí, dale. The patients here, they do real work. Useful, socially useful work. Like, for example, these uh, raising the chickens. Like, for example, raising the chickens. And growing roses. And growing roses. <laughs> and uh, in addition, they get paid for whatever work they do in the hospital. I'm quite impressed. Sterling is more skeptical, and we argue constantly about what is natural in human society. Mm -hmm. These chickens look so peaceful, I wonder what sort of a social system they have. Estos pollos lucen tan quietos, tan pacíficos, eh? Se pregunta. Será el sistema nuestro, será el sistema de los cubanos. Bien, eso habría que, eh, habría que preguntárselo a los pollos. He's suggesting that you please be ask one of them. <laughs> But does he think they're communist chickens? ¿Cree usted que son pollos comunistas? <laughs> Por lo menos lo hacían en un sistema comunista. Por lo menos lo hacían en un sistema comunista. ¿Qué dice? Uh, they were born under this system, they're going to be eaten by communists. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised if they raise their hands and say, They're born to live and die under communism. <laughs> Foolishness with the chickens leads by chance to something, someone, saner. And here I am. <laughs> tell, tell. Still thought in English. Ma Maria. Mary or Maria? Mary. Mary. My Mary. name's Mary Carol. Good. Carol. Sure, Mary Carol. C A R O R O W L. Sure, you know, like the song, Oh Carol. Yeah. <laughs> you live here all the time? Oh, heavens no. I just came here to get well, because I'm epileptic. Oh, yeah? How long have you been here? Well, a month, and I'll be out soon, I hope. What do you think of the idea of making it like a working hospital where everybody works? Why, that it's a very normal idea. And for abnormal patients, I think that's the best treatment. Because you'll find the same thing outside. Getting to like to work. Oh, you yes. know, the yes. many people just don't like it. Yes, I know someone who doesn't like it. Mary? What did you say about Fidel? What's your opinion? I think he's a very great and a very busy man. Great how? The only way a person can be great. Serving other people and helping them to live better, of course. Yeah, but what about those who just don't care, who don't want to help others? They must exist. They are selfish people, of course. But they're being, well, I guess you can always talk to a selfish person and explain to them just why they're selfish and why it'll do them just no good. Some of them might understand, others will never understand, and they'll always be selfish. What about the opinions of life generally in Cuba today? Is it a lot better? Well, I'm still here, aren't I? Yeah, but that doesn't prove it's a lot better just because you're still here. Oh, yes, it does. My mom, my mother and my father are both in the States. And I could have been there, too. My mother went in 1961. And I didn't go. I don't like people who think that they're better because they're white or they have blue or black eyes or you get it. Or they're just not Jews. There must be a better way of thinking things out. That's a sure thing. And I'm still here. Could you have gone? Of course I could. I had everything ready. 
What sort of a passport was that? My passport? Cuban no. Passport. I told you I was born in Cuba. What sort of passport would a Cuban have? An American one? My dear man, I'm the one who's the patient here, not you. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. I gotta, I gotta go home now. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you Bye, very Michael. Much. Very nice to talk to you. Bye, Mary. Bye. Prime Minister, would you uh, would you tell me what your thoughts on on a thing that in Canada we prize highly? Your thoughts on the matter of parliamentary democracy? What about having a system of government that is answerable to that elected body? And uh, now you had a revolution, and this wasn't done with pop guns or bows and arrows, it was a pretty serious business. Suppose we were to ask him, look, Prime Minister, look, Dr. Castro, did the United States make you a communist? Cut you off and they cut off uh, supplies and they wouldn't allow anything to be shipped into Cuba and they wouldn't allow anything to be shipped from Cuba into the US, and they cut you off. It was a natural development for me to become a communist. Would he say that? What would he say? I, I, I think that, that, that maybe it works in two ways. I think, in a sense, the antagonism of the United States has served Cuba very well, because what it's done has been a terrific emotional unifier. And they've used this antagonism and able to sort of keep a sort of sense of solidarity. Well, there's no, yeah. there's no real fulfillment in life if your life is based only on the accumulation of materialism and selfish. Let's right. face it, any mature man accepts that. Any really right. intellectual. Well, then in that case, there are quite a few people who are not mature. Well, of course, that's because the they problem. don't accept. But they, but their sons might, and their sons' sons might. That's what the hippie movement was all about: was a realization that the middle, the upper middle class, and affluence. Uh, that, uh, that these men were enjoying that wasn't enough, and that's what developed the hippie movement. There are so many things we have to see. Alamar, for instance. A whole new city being constructed by amateur builders. In an attempt to meet the incredible housing shortages. Their enthusiasm makes me a bit giddy. It seems to intoxicate Joey. Without recalling his own blockbusting days. Are you uh, a construction worker? Usted un trabajador de la construcción? No. No. Well, uh, what are you? ¿Qué cosa es usted? Eh, marinero. Sailor. I'm a sailor. A sailor. Marinero. A fisherman no, or pescador. sailor? Pescador o marinero. No, no, marinero. Sailor. Sailor. And why? Why are you on a construction job? ¿Por qué está usted entonces haciendo trabajo de construcción? Por la necesidad de que nosotros tenemos en este momento que la vivienda. Mr. Chappie just explained that uh, 80% of all the people working in the Alamar subdivision did in, this, not, in, this did, in this housing project did not have any previous construction experience at all. See, they... Uh, they weren't all sailors, though. No, no. The Some way, were sailors. All places of work. Very many places of work. In this case, we happen to be in a building that is being built by workers of the Merchant Marine. Well, Cuban all Merchant all, Marine. all the workers on this particular building are sailors. Yes. And we have a specialized work experts yes. that are constantly on the work, on the site. Yes. We, we don't, just don't have enough construction workers to build a city like this one, which incidentally yes. is going to be by 1982, 1983, a city of 130,000 people. 130,000 people. Size of St. John's. So, uh, no, we don't have sufficient enough uh, construction workers because we are building factories 
Yeah. And now the workers themselves in this place of, in this place of work, they meet together and they do the selection. To whom will the department go? To which workers? Which worker will the department go? They decided by a majority vote. Bueno, pues, eh, otro, yo no voy a vivir aquí. Va a vivir otro compañero aquí. Te is, it, is it successful? Well, you take a look around yourself, see what you see. Well, no, the buildings look good, but I mean, uh, are they slow? Or are they quick? Are they efficient? Well, many of the buildings already are inhabited now, have been given. Now, there's one thing that I should add here. The rent that people living in Alamo pay is uh, 6% of whatever the breadwinner makes. Of his salary. Of his salary. Fantastico. Fantastico. Oh, to live in Gay Havana, in the concrete blocks of clay, and the workers from the anthills coming out to start each day. Oh, the pure and right endeavor as they shovel dirt and clay, singing songs of inspiration as they toil day after day. No more need to worry of redemption, no need to bow their heads in prayer, for they know that they are the chosen, made of nothing more than clay. Ah, the gay and happy workers, toiling daily for the state, if they reach their happy quota, on Sundays they can sleep in late. Not, not Jeff, did you write that? <laughs> it's clever. Do you believe that or are you just being cynical? Oh, I'm just being cynical. I mean, I think we've seen down here. You're poking fun. And be negative. Well, I think that's one of the great things that maybe we have, is a sense of humor, and, and, and you, as you know only too well, having... You know, I, I, there was an irritation in my mind at the slur on the concrete boxes. I wish to God every family in different land in St. John's had homes as good as these concrete cages. <laughs> I go back later to see the people who've already moved into Alamar. The occasion is a block party to celebrate Women's Day. Small prizes are given. This is not an organized visit, so it makes a good cross-check on our daylight tours. <laughs> La compañera Emilia. The refreshments are simple and homemade. Living in the luxury of number nine, we forget that many basic foods are rationed in Cuba. Some observers see rationing as a failure of the revolution, but here at least everyone gets an equal share at a cheap price. Perhaps in this lower consumption, we're seeing a vision of our own future. All aboard! Where are we going today? This is the university city for yeah. technology faculties. And what are we going to see? Well, uh, it's part of the University of Havana. Right. Except that only all the engineering yeah. and architecture yeah. careers are in this school. Is it a good place to have an argument about religion? Uh, it's a wonderful place to have that kind of argument. <laughs> okay. Okay. We're going to a university where the students not only pay no fees, but are paid to study. In only one other place in the Americas has this been tried, Newfoundland. And the man who set it up was Smallwood. But he lost the support of the Newfoundland youth. And at the 69 leadership convention, the students gave him the Nazi salute and shouted fascist. And that hurt. Did 
Do you see any danger of government and people drifting apart? New population who knoweth not uh, Fidel. 20 hours a week they, they study in the university and 20 hours a week they work in factories practicing what they learn here. 40 hour a week. Well, I think it's extremely clever because it gives the workers the illusion that they're university students. It's like the 11 year olds in the factories 15 hours a week. We've got machines now to do the workers' work. I mean, do you really think that there's such a, a tremendous exaltation in just working? We're having an argument here, Dean, because uh, he's saying that in the future, machines will replace work, you know, uh, in yeah. factories and so on. So why put students in factories to learn something that is becoming obsolete? What is the reason for it? Maybe that's obsolete in your country, but on this one, no. We are, we are only developed. We're right. trying to be developed. So yeah. we have some years here before had to to be in that situation so you're a you're a practical part of the the communist society right now not the communists yes. we are not communists yes we are socialists oh you're socialists here it. so no we are socialists in the whole cuba oh i see not communists no That's and do you eventually point. end up back in capitalism pardon <laughs> <laughs> i mean my, our thinking is that i mean at least mine mm -hmm. is that in a certain level of development you have to go socialistic at a lower level, you have to be communistic. As you get higher, as you educate your masses, as they start to you soar, end up capitalist. you not not necessarily capitalist, but a whole new system of, of of freedom of the individual and freedom of the society to expand itself. A Jonathan Seagull, surely, is that's what we're 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 searching for: is perfection of you as an individual before you finally drop this body and go on again. I'm going again. Well, go yes. Sir. That's a theory. That's a theory <laughs> of mine. I don't agree with you in that point. <laughs> You just remember when you get that hard pain one day, you know, uh -huh. there's nothing else. That's finished. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. Where do we go now, Dean? Now we're going to the White House. Where? 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 To the White House. Oh. The White House? Yes. Let me go it's the called the White House because it's, as you see it, over It's white. <laughs> yes. The White House was a former plantation residence. Now it's a student union. You, you are the uh, president of the student union in this part of the university. We talked to the student president who studied in the States, while behind us, North Vietnamese play ping pong. In New York. In New York. Five years. Five years. I lived there. Then I came back to my country and I began to work. And then about five years ago, I started to study again at uh, this faculty in Canada. But when the, when the revolution at the United States, I only uh, wanted to, to study, to be an engineer, to have money, to, to try to live like a rich man. That was my, my aspiration. I only think it in money and dress and well, all cars, all of that. Purely and selfish. Purely selfish. Now I have another motivation. I really don't care about the, how much I'm going to earn, how much I'm going to have when I become You want some. Well, I need some because I have to eat and I have yeah. to, to dress. But uh, that's not really what we want. You see, we want to, to finish our career, to start to work, because we know that we have to build factories. We have to build uh, roads. Hospital, mm. all what mm. our people need now, mm. and we know that when we are building a sugar mill, there is no owner that's going to have it for him to have a house like this. There's areas that we've got to change. The first thing that probably would happen in a socialist or, or communist country, you would take over the radio stations I run. That would be the first thing you'd do. I mean, I would not be allowed on your station here to say what I think about maybe to be totally different in the concept, would I, of. of uh, of how you should run things? Would I be allowed to go in there and say it? I might be allowed to say it, but I may not get out of the building. Uh, yes, maybe, because you are not under democracy. You are under the dictatorship of uh, workers. The that's dictatorship of workers? Yeah, that's right, workers' dictatorship. The workers' dictatorship. That's the principle of socialism and communism. Too. The workers' dictatorship, which that's means right. in the final analysis, one man, doesn't it? No, no. you are wrong. No. That's the point. That's uh, the whole people. But I can talk to you about my friend, about these uh, young people that I meet, that they are 15, 20 years old, and they feel just like I feel. See, they, they 
they love the country, they love the revolution, they love the government because they didn't know the past. And they love Fidel? And they love Fidel. Yes. I think to know the past is good. It's good because you have the, the experience and you can compare. This yeah. chap who's written the book about the Stalinist days, uh -huh. they're hounding him now and, and, and de denouncing him and calling him everything under the sun. And uh, the lady who had one copy of the manuscript was tortured and finally committed suicide. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and yet he was, all he was trying to do was write history, right? Yes. Well, would you, would you, do you, do you, uh, do you see anything incompatible with that? With it depends if it goes against the principles stated by the dictatorship of Orgus. But it always That's goes against point. the principles if it's critical. No. It doesn't. No, you have the right to criticize. You do? Yes. It takes a lot of guts, doesn't it? As, as, Kurt, as, Gert, as Khrushchev said, when he was asked, why didn't you protest when Stalin was in power? Somebody shouted out at the Congress, why didn't you protest? He stopped and he said, who said that? And there was dead silence and nobody stood up. Nobody. He said, that's why. Do you think you say it? That's happening now. It's happening now in Russia. Mm, I don't believe so. You don't? No. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy. I have easy. read and studied socialism for 60 years. Mm -hmm. And this is my understanding throughout my whole life, yeah. that, that it takes time. It can't be done overnight. That's right. But, but what you aim at, your purpose is to build a classless society. First of all, in communism, let's say, the maximum one we have to, to achieve, you have to give as far as you can, and you will receive to him whatever that, you need. Yes, yes. That's the point, in communism. Yeah. Right? No, that's, in that, communism. Excuse me, that is, yeah. uh, that now, is, in socialism, that is a reversion to, to the early teachings of the Christian faith. That's the and communism. The state, and right? the state disappears, it vanishes. That's right. Yeah, yeah, there and you is. have justice right. and beauty of among mankind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what we will socialism? have this. Now, I uh, won't live to no, see socialism. it, and you won't. No, I won't, I'm no. sure. Now, what socialism? It's completely different. Different than co communism. In the end, yes. they're both yes. different. Yes, you have to have first socialism to get communism. What's the difference? The difference <laughs> mainly is that you have to give as far as you can, and you will receive as, as far as you give. Would. Is that right? For me? If you work eight hours, you will receive for eight hours. If you work 12, you will receive for 12. You're saying if That's a socialist works six, eight hours, he gets eight hours return. If he works 12, he gets 12 hours return. Yeah. Well, that's what happens in the free enterprise system. In Basically, principle. is that you're working in capitalism for one guy, the one for who you. owns the factory, and the money goes for no, him. Just, just and maybe he can share. I'm not going to refer to you. That's right. <laughs> so maybe he can share the things with the workers. That's one case. But right. tell me the system, the whole system is going to do that, is doing that in which society? Tell me just one. You were talking about capitalism as it existed back 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, we now have a free enterprise system where you can buy stock. You can work in a radio station, right? Yes, I can. And you can work as a radio announcer. And, yes. and each week you can buy stock in that radio station. Yes. Right? And eventually, if you work hard enough, you can probably be the main stockholder. Yes. Yeah. Because I work at New York, at a chemical bank. I was working and I had shares. I received 10% of my salary in shares. Do you, do you think that they would listen to me and they would? Did you do? go to a Did you go to a stock uh, stock market? Uh, I meeting? was a worker. I, I earned 70 dollars a week and then I had my shares. Yes. But Chemical Bank, it, there was millions and millions of dollars in shares. There were very few people that really can uh, uh, that own it that can, that bank. They were the, the, the people that really did what they wanted to do. Right. Now in Cuba, for example, I work at the bank also, Same. and I was working, I, and I gave my opinion. All the workers of one department, they speak, and they say, well, I think this is wrong. This is not the way that we should do this. We should do this this way. And that opinion goes to the, to the president of the bank. Even he was himself, the president of the bank was sitting with you at that meeting, right. just like him right. now. Right. No, he's not a student, right. he's one of the uh, professors. And I can give him my opinion and I can tell you, look, I, I think the way that classes are uh, given here are not correct. Do you think a student in New York or, or a capitalist can do that? He sure can. Premier Smallwood created a university in Newfoundland. The first people, once that university was finished, the first people to surround his parliamentary building with placards 
and with marchers and with protesters with the same with the same students, right? Who were demanding certain things. Just had word from Fidel's chief of protocol. The interview is on, and we'll have a whole day with him. Fantastic. Next terror of the gods. So to celebrate, we're going for a swim and to look at the site of an invasion. Sterling is anxious to get back. He has an appointment next week in Thailand. And Joey now has enough questions to fill a small book. It reverses the body against the gravitational pull, opens up the organs in the body and allows them to, to relax and reverse themselves and therefore it makes the body more healthy. The Cuban people are materially better off and even better off in health and in education, but, but, but they have no freedom. Would that be a, a truthful statement to be made about Cuba today? Well, every time gold goes up. Well, it's gone up. Ten dollars an ounce. So it's gone up. We make a million dollars. So you made a million or your companies have made a million in the last week. Yeah. I think you should present every nickel of that to Cuba. You do. Yeah. What, wouldn't I, if I'm going to present it to anybody, I'm going to present it to my corporation to expand television throughout Newfoundland. That's where it's going. I don't, why don't you ask Fidel for a license to start television in Cuba? Because I know his answer. You don't know until you ask him. Well, I have a pretty good comprehension, let us say. But there are still 20,000 Newfoundlanders, Joseph, who can't get television anywhere, either CBC or us. So you want to spend it? And it'll cost at least a million, or maybe it'll cost actually about three million, to cover them. But well, then if gold goes to uh, 160, you're covered. If it goes to 170, we're covered. So this is Cuba and the Bay of, the Bay of Pigs area to the south coast of the middle province. That's three years. Now, this map shows the first the recruiting office in Miami, in Miami City. <clears throat> Air route to Guatemala, where they had their training camp. From Puerto, from Puerto Cabezas, on, they came straight to Cuba. They hit Cuba on the south coast of, of, of the middle of Cuba at the Bay of Pigs. What date? On the 17th April, they landed. What year? In 1961. Twice. Some of the Confederates say you can. I can walk on the Twice, Cuba has been invaded in the past 20 years and less. First time by Fidel Castro. Second time by John F. Kennedy. Did you know that according to the um, inside, um, the, the invisible government, that it seemed to have been the whole ploy was sort of a, a thing meant to take place before the election. The invasion of Cuba would have been the big issue of the Kennedy-Nixon, if, if, if the invasion had taken place, that Nixon would have won by a walkout. Yeah, well, it didn't work, did it? Something has gone wrong. The streets are full of color, but it's nothing to do with us. Honecker, the head of the government of East Germany, arrives to monopolize Fidel's time.
Money doesn't talk here. You can't buy an interview with Fidel. Power talks anywhere. You know, when I saw Mrs. Gandhi in India, when she made an appointment, she went, she has a country of 550 million people, and she was there on time. Relations between Jeff and myself are deteriorating. Sterling is worried about his financial stake in this film. Because I believe, regardless of how much money anybody has, it's academic when you're making a film. The film itself has to stand on its own feet. And unless the film can return the cost of making the film... He's been leaving me messages. This morning I got one on tape. ...rationale to say that some things are worth doing, although they can't bring their money back. I can't buy that any more than I can buy the, the Beatles. If the Beatles couldn't sell as a very successful... I think we should discuss this on film because I think yeah. there's a fundamental I think difference. A, I think there's a very a basic difference. I mean, I have nothing against films making a profit. I think it's great if they do. Mm. But, but that is not the rationale of the film board. Yeah, but we're dealing with taxpayers' money. So we are There's board. a lot of children who could get an education, who could get their bodies repaired if we waste money. Now, if we shoot a film, and I have been on many film crews, and I've had the same problem, and they start to overshoot. Now, the film was to be done of, of uh, Castro for national release, in which I made it very plain at the film board that we were going to break even. And in my opinion, all we need now is an hour of Castro, and we've got what I came Look, down with. We agree film about finished. that. We agree about an hour of Castro, and we agree that now, if the, the film makes the, the film, film board, the five the million film, dollars, I couldn't care less. Okay, okay. You, got, you got three minutes. Okay. 33, exactly even time. What I'm trying to say to you is that I hope that the film makes a profit, but the profit can be measured in other ways besides money. What we're trying to do is make a film that is profitable in, sense, in the sense of a relationships between two countries. And that, to me, is far more important. Mike, there's, there's two different things here you've got to understand. The film board's position of, of shooting film that has a value other than the films that we are doing. This is a, absolutely a different experiment. It was set up as an experiment, Mike. Very Well, you may not have been in the meetings. It was it never was told set. to me that. Well, that's your problem, but I'm telling you now because I happen to be the guy that's paying the bread for that tape that's running and that film is running. And I'm telling you it was set up as an experiment to see if we could bring in a film that was good enough for a lease in NBC. And if you go over, as I know, I mean, I've had too many camera crews and my instructions are three to one in color, five to one in black, and we tough. Why did you come to the film board? You know we do 20 to one. <laughs> Not with me, you don't. Well, why didn't you say that That's in those your meetings? problem. Why didn't you say that in those because meetings? Because it never entered my head you tried to shoot 20 to 1. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm you shoot, Mike, if, to you... tell me, look, now, just a minute, Mike, maybe you're going to spend the rest of your life as a, graying, is going to be 25 as a good, to one. graying, fat guy who has never, Nonsense. ever done anything under 25 to 1. But if it is, Mike, you are so far out of it, man, as a look. producer, that you, it's just a f joke. Look, you think it's, it's somehow a, a f you joke. Think... 25 to 1. Mike, for the love of man, you've got to be kidding me. I'm 25 to 1 to put a film on? Yes. How much yes. talent have you got yes. if you can't it's shoot less than that? It's not a question of talent. If you've got a script together, man, and you know what you're going to put together, you need 3 to 1 of the outside. Bullshit. Who in the hell Absolute are you kidding? Bullshit. Well, come and meet a few professional directors. They, they'd laugh at you. If I told them 20... Wait till they see this film. They'll say, my God, who was that guy? What did he call himself a film? On what grounds did he call himself a filmmaker? Are you feeling a bit frustrated, Joe? Yeah. I, I still have faith. I have faith in Fidel. In fact, doesn't Fidel mean faith? That's right. Fidelity. Fidelity. Fidel. That's right. But he has faith. I have faith. I must ask him what the name Fidel means when I'm going to ask him about his religious faith. Well, I'll ask him, question. doesn't his very name? I mean, hmm? That's a new question you have. Hmm? That's a new question. Yeah. <clears throat> Good one. Yeah. I'm prepared to understand, I'm prepared to make all kinds of reasons, even excuses, because I had a job once, something like his job, a, a bit like it. I had a cabinet, he has a cabinet. I had ministers, he had ministers. Yeah. Yeah and responsibilities, and cares, and concerns, and... Uh... Yes. 
Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Reception. Fine. Fine, yes. But I, I'm sorry, I have no dark suit. I say I have no dark suit. Well, look, why don't you try it anyway? Hey, it's a semi-formal thing, black. Hey, Jack, you need it. come up here. I want to shoot quick. Something interesting's happening. The only suit in our entire party belongs to the assistant cameraman, Al Morgan, who in fact is traveling with three suits, 17 shirts, 25 ties, and several bottles of scotch. Come on, try it on for once. Yeah, I'd, be great, but I'd like to have a coat to go to the thing. Oh, it's pretty good. Huh? I'd rather wear my own pants. These are going to be if too big. If you're going to go on board, things go right all the way through the whole thing. They're going to be too big. They're going to be too big. Come on, pull them up. Pull oh, them up. You'd be surprised. It's in there. You, you are bigger than I am, aren't Never you? Mind. No, Never mind. Like Look, glove. you're going to make me feel good, for goodness sakes, if these things fit. It fits you like a glove, Joe. It doesn't fit Too bad it doesn't fit you like a suit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trouble. <laughs> okay, let's find it. Hey! Uh, my God. Fine, oh, Jesus. Hey, it's a couple of the proudest moments of my bloody life, you old bugger. There's no way I'm going to be able to uh, tell anybody this. You know that, eh? There's no way I'm going to be able to tell anybody this. It's going to be a secret. I can't go around in the... How about this? I feel like a tramp. Well, no, I don't want to hurt the feelings of your previous tailors, but I suggest that the pants you now have on fit you better than anything I've seen you in 25 years. Hey, hey, hey. What a proudest oh, moment of my life, you old son of a gun. I think it really looks great. Really, this let's, is, uh, let's, let's get this the thing done really right now. Smart. Yeah. Thank you, really. You know, so Joey will make it to the state reception for Hanukkah. Bring him back Pretty alive. Good, huh? Bring him back alive. about you fellas, but if that's an indication of, of certain elements within a new system, then I think the new system will be better. I think it's okay. I think we've got them. Uh, what a night. <laughs> there are 800 people there, diplomats from all around the world. And here was Fidel and Honecker from Germany lined up, and I go in, and I get the second bear hug of my life. Once before only I had a bear hug. That was in the White House, Richard Nixon. Tonight, I get it from Fidel, and I said, Fidel, look, I said, we're here from Canada, seven of us from the, from the National Film Board. We've got the best equipment there is in the world. And I said, an awful lot of money is being spent. And we got, I said, we got 20,000 feet shot already in color. And I said, oh, this is useless without you. We, we've got to have you. We've got to have an interview. And we're going to build the whole thing around you. And he said, all right. I said, yeah, all right. All right. But I said, the plane is coming tomorrow night. And we're off. I, I, I brought up reinforcements. I saw the Canadian ambassador, Mr. Bow. He said, I'll do what I can. I saw the chief of uh, protocol, and he said he would talk to Fidel tonight. Then I talked with the representative of the Pope, uh, bi the bishop, and the apostolic delegate. I didn't talk exactly about that. I talked about other things with him. And uh, I, was, I was very much encouraged. I, I said to him, do you think that the government of Fidel Castro, the communist government of Cuba, are really working, really striving for the good of the people of Cuba? What would your answer be? He said, of course. I said, they are. He said, of course. I thought that was at least impressive, to say the least. That's why he's been there 30 years. <laughs> this is why the uh, Holy Father has left him here. Well, of the... course. <laughs> <laughs>
taking all the uh, stuff to uh, the airport. Well, we're going on somewhere else. Oh, oh, oh. What have you decided to do? Home. Home. I was very pleased indeed to meet him. Will you will you tell him that? I will certainly do so. I'd like to uh, I'd like to say too that I think that we should thank the Cuban government for the exceptionally uh, warm hospitality we've received here. We couldn't have received more courtesy and more hospitality from all members of the of the translating staff and the members of the ministry. That's true. <laughs> yes, waiting for Fidel. That's the film we have right now. Yeah. That's a good film. Yeah. Waiting okay. for Fidel. Well, goodbye. I'd like to take some of Fidel's weather with us. Have a good trip. Mama? I was here last year and I was then a former head of government and they put me in a nice hotel, but not in marble halls. Well, there must be a message there somewhere. You, you Maybe mean, they know well, since back then I hall. met uh, Fidel Castro at Gander and uh, we had a lovely chat. That's right. And I said, I'd like to come down and make a movie. He said, come down and, and uh, we will help in every way. That's right. Well, now do you think a... he really knows us? I mean, maybe he knows you, but do you think he knows that Jeff is a millionaire? Does he know no, that? I'm, I'm sure he does. Yeah. I've told every official who has, <laughs> <laughs> who has come what? to see what? us from external me. affairs that uh, Jeff Sterling is a very, very rich man, I, I, and he's not coming down here to swallow this communism lock, uh, lock stock, stock and barrel, barrel. Or hook, line, and sinker. Well, I certainly hope you also told them that I give back to my fellow human beings 76 cents on every dollar. Oh, no, you I don't make. give it, they take it. The uh, government takes it in I, taxes. Well, in that sense, but I give it willingly. Well, that's good. That's good. Sterling took holidays here before the revolution. Now he finds Havana seedy and run down. But the Cubans say that they're putting their efforts into the countryside, for Havana was always overfed. Prime Minister, what, what difference has the revolution made in these things? In crime and alcoholism and dope and organized prostitution and unemployment and poverty and slums. Cuba was really notorious. <laughs> Infamous even. Tell me about it, would you? Yes, Joey's been calling himself a socialist all his life. Hence his interest in this island, this leader, and this revolution. Those in favor of the revolution, put up their hand. Look at Those that. who are not in favor of the revolution make a long face. Todos aquellos, fíjese, no levanta la mano hasta que no lo diga. Todos aquellos que están a favor de la revolución que levantan la mano y los que no. Those in favor. Okay. And now, at 73, he's free to travel, practice some unofficial diplomacy, and have some fun in strange places.
siblings from Newfoundland too. They've known each other for years and in fact were once on opposite sides of the Confederation fight. The Cubans certainly seem to be expecting us. This fleet of Volgas, this house at our disposal, Protocol House Number 9 it's called, former residence of an American textile tycoon. So here apparently we'll wait, sorting out our questions. Waiting for Fidel to drive through the gates. Prime Minister, you're a, a doctor, Dr. Fidel Castro. What? A doctor of what, Prime Minister? What are you a doctor of? And was this doctorate conferred on you, honoris causa? I mean, <laughs> Maybe any, that's why they put us here. Anybody, yeah, yeah but they, they, they put us there because we have a head of a former head of government with us, uh, who's, who's this guy? Who they, and they had to and they had to go through the protocol, which were here. If we weren't here with him, we'd probably be down at ten in the. Havana Tower, 118.1, Delta Oscar Mike. A chartered jet en route from Montreal to Havana. On board, with a bottle of wine, Jeff Sterling, owner of radio and TV stations in Eastern Canada, a film crew from the National Film Board, and Joseph R. Smallwood, who for 23 controversial years was Premier of Newfoundland. He's known to all as Joey. I went to uh, the Soviet Union, and uh, I don't care if I ever saw this guy over it again. I went to the People's Republic of China, and I was flabbergasted. I was fascinated. I was, I was entranced. I think it's perhaps the most exciting place there is on this earth today. But here, right alongside us, is Cuba. And I, I thought I'd like to go down and see you know, after all the talk there's been, very little of it, if any, friendly. But Sterling is investing in more than just a friendly visit. There's been an invitation from Castro himself. We're going to do films and documentaries. They should be films and documentaries that have some positive aspect and some overview. And if we can film Fidel, we'll have something rich and rare. And there's no use our asking him unless he agrees to answer. If he'll allow us to ask him, to spell out for us what price uh, Cuba demands for the uh, restoration of perfectly normal conditions, relations between the US and Cuba. If you do that, uh, we could be the ones to break the news to the world. Welcome to Cuba, the capitalist and the socialist. <laughs> the interview may be a day or two, so in the meantime there are excursions to take. The island that Joey ruled was almost as poor as Cuba, especially in services for people like schools and hospitals. These he built, and these of course he wants to see in Cuba. So this first morning, we're at a revolutionary new high school just outside Havana, the Lenin School. It looks relaxed, not so different. But really, it's utterly different. You need marks in the 80s to enter and to stay. 
you have a tough schedule that starts at 6 a.m. each morning and ends at 10 p.m. No dreamy adolescence here. You're here to learn to work. And they live in it all the, all the week around. Uh, Saturday afternoon, they get a free bus and they, they go home. They come back 11 o'clock Sunday night. Okay, so they're spending five and a half days there in that school. They're fed, they're clothed, they pay no tuition fees. They pay nothing for anything. It's all completely free. Do they get paid and for five, the 15 hours of work? No, wait, no. Five yeah. hours a day. Yes, they get paid for it with free tuition, mm. free clothes, free food. Like our Newfoundland fishermen used to, with no money involved. They get five hours a day tuition. Three hours a day, they go in this classroom or that classroom or the other classroom where they make baseballs, they make, uh, they make baseball uh, mitts, Mitt. they make uh, shorts to wear, they make sweaters, they make, uh, they assemble radio sets. Computers. And they assemble computer sets and so on. Okay, three hours a day. So, uh, the, it's not a sweatshop. You yeah. seem to be equating it with that. Yeah, but I, I can't help, uh, uh, Mike, equate anything. I see a child of, of 11 years of age sitting at a sewing machine uh, for 15 hours a week. Now, that little girl uh, could certainly be doing other things. She's going to have to be sitting at that sewing machine soon, sooner or later. And surely you're not going to steal. It doesn't her. follow that she will. Look, Jeff, there's something <laughs> Your else. Your eyes must tell you it's not a switch. Look, there's you're talking else. But look, 15 hours a week. Uh, and so many, 11 uh, years in 10 years, old. nothing in 10 compared. years, that's so many hours. That's <laughs> nothing <laughs> compared to what our children spend in front of television. But that's nonsense. It I've got children nonsense. the same age and they don't spend it. I mean, you're throwing all these generalities, Mike. I don't care about children. Mike. We're it talking is not about... true. You're talking 11, 12, 13, 14-year-old children in factories 15 hours a week. They're now, for the love of heaven. That's not factories. They're classrooms. Oh, look, if you want to be apologetic for this whole system, that's fine. But it isn't my way of looking no, at it. No, I want to learn something. You well, don't want to learn anything. You're not learning. You're saying, put the child, put the child I in here, make something. him happy 15 hours a week, making these little things which one machine can make. Your trouble is oh, I'm that sure you look trouble. upon work as a penalty, as a No, punishment. I don't. I look work. upon York as a chance to expand, but work is not... The, the work of the laborer, the work of the hands, the work is a chance to expand the God-given things that God gave you, which they don't believe in. Every which means child in Cuba works with his hands. How many grandchildren do he you does, have? He does, he does, I'm not talking about them. I want to ask them when I get back. Uh, all I right. Take a vote. Every they child, I would like to see every child in Newfoundland and in Canada work. I would like to smash, At what age will you start? I would like to smash forever, for all time, anyone's habit of looking down his nose at work, at the worker. I would like to see every child